What's up, church? We doing good? We all right? So good. I want to take a minute. I want to welcome everybody who's watching online. And of course, everybody who's over at the South Side, South Campus, North Campus. We're so glad that you're here. And uh, we just want to love you. And the best way that we can do that is by clapping for you. So would you mind clapping for that person sitting next to you and behind you and just letting them know that you're glad they're here? Well, um, we are continuing a series that we have called Forward. And uh, if you've missed any of these messages, I just want to take a minute. I want to encourage you to go check them out online. This verse in Isaiah that we just referenced in the, in the sermon bumper that we've been talking about over the last few weeks is just straight up powerful. Talking about how God wants to bring streams in the wilderness. And I really believe that's God's will for us. I believe that's God's will for you. And uh, I believe that's what God has for us. I believe he wants to, to do great things in us. He wants to do great things through us. And it's happening because we are moving forward, y'all, in Jesus' name. If you believe it, say, I do. I 100% do. And so check out those messages. We're moving forward. And today we're going to be talking about full throttled generosity. All right? That's how we're going to move forward. It's with full throttled generosity. If, you have, if you're taking notes, write that down at the top of your notes, full throttled generosity. And as we introduce this topic today, I want to highlight a way that you, uh, our church, was generous yesterday, all right? This just happened yesterday, which is really cool, something to celebrate. But our, our volunteers had connected us, one of our volunteers had connected us with a family who, uh, who had adopted their eight-year-old niece, Brianna, who is nonverbal and in a motorized wheelchair. But they didn't, have a, they didn't have a ramp for their house. And so every time they would go in and out of the house, it was a whole thing. It was a whole production just to get in and out of the house. And so, and not only that, but she didn't have a place to ever go outside. It was very difficult. So she was just inside all the time. Going places was hard, so that means they just went places less. We found out about it. And uh, we partnered with them. We said, in Jesus' name, we're going to do something about this. And so uh, we donated the materials, sent some volunteers yesterday, coordinated with a ministry uh, called Hope Builders. And I want to show you what we were able to do. Uh, so this is the before picture, okay? And uh, obviously, uh, they put a ramp in there, and then they started building this ramp and, uh, and put it all together, made it so that she could get in and out easily and... Um, and then there's uh, Brianna right there and the, the volunteers that helped build it. And then we have one more of her enjoying it uh, after it was all done. Isn't that really cool, everybody? Come on. It, I just want to celebrate that. I want you to know that that's who we are as a church and that's what we're supposed to be. Amen? Finding needs, meeting needs, taking care of situations, and pushing back the darkness of the enemy. And uh, it's, about, it's about generosity. That's what it, moving forward looks like opening up. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. I want to talk about how life is better when we live opened up. All right, and to illustrate this, I want to uh, tell a story of last year my wife had coordinated with, with a guy who goes to our church who owns a 1970s 454 big block Chevy uh, Chevelle. I mean, this thing is just amazing. It's a, it's a monster. You hear it from a mile away. It's just incredible. So, so my wife had, uh, I, I didn't know this, but after Saturday night service, went home, and there was the Chevelle in the garage. And so she would coordinated us borrowing it for a day, for 24 hours. And so we get home. My boys were just so excited to drive this thing. And uh, so we got in it, and it's got two settings, actually, on the, on the Chevelle. You can actually com control it from the remote, uh, from the little key remote. One is just the normal setting. That's loud. And then the, there's another setting that bypasses the exhaust, which is louder and just frankly better, okay? It's just always better when it's louder, right? And so, uh, so we got a chance to drive this. I want to show this to you, show you this little video. Uh, this, is, this is us pulling out of our driveway right there. Yeah. There's my kids. Now that. That is how a car is supposed to sound. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Full throttle. The benefit of also having that exhaust open is that you smell like gas when you get to the place that you're going, which is just an extra benefit, all right? It's just extra, just a little bit extra. It's awesome. 
and my kids were totally into it. We're driving down the highway, opening it up, and they're like, oh, I know we're faster than them. I know we're faster than them. And I'm like, they're getting a little bit of proud. It's not even our car, you know. I'm just like, simmer down, boys. But, uh, but, um, so, but you know, I love, there's just something about being opened up. Like, it's more fun when it's opened up. It's louder. It's more fun. But so on a different level, uh, this is like totally different spectrum, so I'm probably speaking to a totally different demographic. There's also the Tesla Model S. Okay, anybody into Teslas out there? Yeah, the Chevelle people were like, yeah. Tesla people are like, mm hmm. Yeah, it's just like different crowd, different crowd. But can we just be honest though? <laughs> can we be honest? The Tesla's a lot faster. It's actually a lot faster. It's like, it's crazy how fast these things go. I don't know if you knew this, but, but the Tesla has three different levels of what they call ludicrous mode. It's like if you want to go fast, there's ludicrous mode, then there's ludicrous plus mode, and then there's ludicrous plus warp mode, okay? If you just want to get crazy. And ludicrous plus, <laughs> ludicrous plus warp mode goes zero to 60, in 2.6 seconds, that's crazy. That's crazy fast. But then he just came out with ludicrous, I think it's ludicrous plus plaid mode, which is zero to 60 in under two seconds. Everybody say, that's really fast. That's really, really fast. And of course the question begs to be asked, is that necessary? One million percent, yes! It is absolutely necessary. And, and the reason I take time to just paint that picture for you is because I want, I want us to talk about living in ludicrous mode, all right? I want, because I really believe that that's what God has designed us for. I think our Christianity is supposed to look like ludicrous mode and not like Camry mode, all right? Nothing, no, nothing against if you have a Camry, all right? Like, you're welcome here. <laughs> but I think, I really believe when you look at the scriptures that God wants us to feel a little bit more ludicrous in an expression of our Christianity. Let me show you John 10.10. 10. You've heard this verse if you've been to church at all. But let me, just, let me just paint this picture for you. I'm going to break it down and hopefully help you see what Jesus was trying to communicate. But he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. All right? That doesn't sound real good. That doesn't sound like life, but that's exactly what the enemy tries to do. That's what sin does. Sin works against life. It works against the heart of God. And that's what the enemy brings into our life. But he says this, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Everybody say full. That's what God wants. Now, you've probably heard that uh, in different translations, the abundant life or overflowing life or the message paraphrase says more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Let me give you what the Greek word for full or abundant or overflowing is. It's this word parisos. Everybody say parisos. Parisos. It is a word that means special advantage, exceptional more than expected, beyond, superfluous, beyond the norm, unnecessary, not required. When I read that, you know what I think of? Ludicrous mode. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like just above and beyond and extra, like full throttle, opened up, just cooking down the highway. I really believe that's what our Christianity is supposed to feel like. That's what our Christianity is supposed to be experienced like. But here's the question that I want all of us to ask ourselves today. Is that what we would view our Christianity like? Do you view your Christianity like ludicrous mode or do you view it more like Camry mode? Because God wants us to, I really believe, to live a little bit more ludicrous than we do. And I believe there are a lot of factors that go into that, all right? So I, I can't, I'm not going to cover, I'm not going to try to just paint a picture that says, hey, there's one simple way that you do this. I think there's, there's a lot of factors that go into this. One, obviously, is being right with God. You got to start with relationship. Then you got to live right, which you got to... You gotta live right, so you gotta, you gotta turn away from your, from your sin and yourself continually. You gotta press towards him. So there's, there's factors that go, you gotta stay in relationship with him. But there's one factor, I think, that we miss a lot in Christianity if we're not careful, and it's, it's living opened up, full throttled, 
pedal to the metal. And the way that you live opened up is by keeping your life opened up. And the expression of that openness is generosity. It's giving back. It's helping others. It's being a blessing. We talk about this all the time at Summit Park. It's one of our, our values is, is we are blessed to be a blessing. And I, I want to prove this to you. I want to prove this to you that that's, this is exactly God's heart for you. Let me show you John chapter 15. Jesus is about to go to the cross. His disciples are nervous. They're anxious because he's been talking about dying. And they're like, that doesn't sound real fun. This sounds really bad for you and us. We've given up everything to follow you. And now you're going to leave us. So he gets together with his disciples and he says, hey, I'm gonna be, I'm, don't worry. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. It's going to be amazing. But I want you to understand how this whole relationship thing works. He says this, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Everybody say much fruit. That's God's will for you. That's God's will for you, that you would bear much fruit. And he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. I love the idea of this fruit analogy. Number one, because I just like fruit. Who doesn't, right? I like all kinds of fruit. I like apples. I like bananas. I like fruit snacks. I mean, that's the kind of fruit. You know, I like orange juice. I mean, I like all of it. And Jesus says... The stuff that he wants to do, this parisos that he wants to bring about in our life, it ends up looking like fruit. Now, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and I want you to bear much fruit. Now, here's the question. Who needs the fruit? Does the vine need the fruit? No. I'm, no, I'm not a botanist, so don't come up afterwards and like, you know, actually, there's some type of genetic code. I don't know, all right? So... But just, let's just keep it simple here. All right, who needs the fruit? Does the vine need the fruit? No. Do the branches need the fruit? No. Who needs the fruit? Everybody else. Everybody else. Everybody walking by the tree. Everybody walking by, by the vine. They're the ones who need the fruit. And when they taste, they're like, man, I want some more of that. And then they get connected to the vine. Do you see how that works? A lot of what, the, a lot of the good things that God wants to bring in our life, a lot of the abundance, a lot of the parisos that God wants to bring in our life is not so that our life can just be better, although that will, that will happen. It's, it's so that we can be, that we can be a blessing to others, that we can bring that goodness to others. The extra is for us for sure. The ludicrous mode is for us for sure. But it, the way we express that is by giving to others. When Jesus sent his disciples out, before he went to the cross, he said, hey, I'm gonna give you a little trial on this mission thing. He says, as you go, proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven is near, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. And then he says, hey, I want you to understand, freely you have received, freely give. If you're taking notes, write that down. Freely you have received, freely give. Give. Your life isn't just for you. It's for you to give and to share with others. Full-throttled life should always result in full-throttled generosity. It's a life that's lived open up. It's a life that overflows. The more we open up, the more God pours in. That's a great place for an amen. Or hallelujah, keep preaching. Any of that will work. Let me show you Proverbs chapter 11. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. It's the person who's generous. Their world just gets larger. Their heart just gets bigger. Their world just gets expanded. But the world of the stingy, it gets smaller and smaller. The more you open up, the more God pours in. The more you hold back, the less that you have. That's just the way it works. We know that, right, from watching The Grinch. Like, you know, once he starts giving, what, his, his heart grew ten times larger that day. You know, like, uh, so it's just, that's what happens when we open up. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed, and those who help others themselves are helped. Here's the big idea. If you're taking notes, write this down. It's the more we give, the more we live. The more we give, the more we live. You want life. You want abundance give. Be generous. Now, this is opposite of how we think it works, right? It's opposite how the world works. The world's like, man, you just get you some more. 
and you get you some more and you keep getting and keep getting and keep getting and that's the goal of I just keep getting more and more and more. And if we're not careful, we take that carnal mentality and we apply it to our Christianity. So I want to talk to Christians a little bit. I want to encourage some Christians. If we're not careful, Christians, you're a follower of Christ, what ends up happening is we buy into that myth and, 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 and this uh, American mindset that says, I just got to keep getting, I got to keep getting. And we, we apply it to our Christianity so we feel like it's okay. Like, I need to read one more book, or I just need to get one more podcast, or I need to go to one more worship concert, and I got like 2,500 different Bible studies that I'm doing on Tuesday. Like, we just keep adding and adding and adding and adding and adding, and we just keep feeding and feeding and feeding and feeding. And let me just tell you, Jesus is interested in your growth. He wants you to be abundant. He wants you to have baristos, but who is the fruit for? Everybody else. And what ends up happening is if we hold back the fruit that God has given us, what happens to fruit that isn't picked? It rots. It gets stale. It doesn't taste very good. I think for us, I think Christians, we've got some rotten fruit. And it's not because Jesus is rotten. And it's not because we're not connected. It's because we're holding on to it. And we need to give it away. We need to share what God has done in our lives. You know, sometimes I hear someone say, you know, I'm, I'm just not getting fed. I'm not getting fed. I need more food. And I want to be like, have you seen the internet? Like, it is fair. Like, there's food everywhere. Like, right now on your phone, you can literally, you can listen to any podcast, to any sermon. You can, you can read any book from all over the world right now. In fact, you could have an AirPod in your ear, and I wouldn't even know if you weren't listening to my sermon if you were listening to somebody else's. And you'd be nodding and be like, amen, oh, that was really good. <laughs> it wasn't even me. Like, that'd be great. Like, like you, can, you can listen. You can grow anytime, anywhere. Listen, we don't have a feed problem spiritually in the world today. Now, I get it. Like, if you grew up, like, in the 1600s, you know, in like Germany, and you only had like one priest, you know, and he wasn't very good. Like, you were kind of stuck, all right? I mean, you just had to pray harder. Like, that was kind of like what you had to do. But today, we've got spiritual food everywhere, right? We've got it everywhere. We don't, we don't have a feed problem. We have a flow problem. We, we, we have a fruit problem. We just keep, we keep it. And we need to flow with it. Now, here's the deal. We've all done this probably at some level. So I'm not trying to harp on us too much. In fact, the disciples did this as well. When Jesus was, was uh, in Jerusalem, he's like, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to come. It's going to be amazing. God's going to do amazing things. Wait in Jerusalem. He's, it's going to, oh, my gosh. I've been building up to this moment. The whole thing's about to open up. Man, wait. This is going to be incredible. We're going to see We're going to see a harvest. We're going to see souls, man. We're going to see lives changed, marriages transformed, people healed. It's going to be incredible. And his disciples gather around him and they ask. Then they, they, they gather in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. They gather around him and ask, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Do you know what they're asking? Lord, are you going to now punch the Romans in the mouth? Are you going to give us our identity? Is this the time when we get all those eternal goodies that you just told us about? Is this the time when we get ours? And Jesus is like, he just had, he was like shaking his head, you know? He was just shaking his head and he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates of the Father is set by his own authority. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Jesus says, all this stuff I've done inside of you is now so that you can go give it away. You can go share it. You can live opened up, full throttle, ludicrous mode, y'all. That's what he has for us. The more you give, the more you live. And Jesus paints this picture with one of his most famous parables in Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn there. We're going to spend just a few moments looking at this. One of the most famous parables is Luke chapter 10. When he, he says... I want you to understand what this whole thing's about. Look, Luke chapter 10. On one occasion, an expert in the law, verse 25, uh, expert, expert in the law stood up to test Jesus and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, What's written in the law? How do you read it? Verse 27, he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
with all your strength, with all your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. We know that Jesus was teaching that very idea, that there was just two basic things, love God, love your neighbor. So Jesus was teaching that. Maybe you'd heard it. He's like, ah, I know what you say. He goes, and so Jesus is like, yeah, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify, and he said, well, who's my neighbor? <laughs> if I was supposed to love my neighbor, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus is like, okay, now we're going to get somewhere. And he draws him in, and he tells him this parable. Watch what he says in verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Not a good situation. A priest happened to be going down the same road. Now, this is a guy who's always at church. This is a professional church person. He should know the law. He should know the rules. He should, be, he should know God better than anybody else, right? Like, that's what professional church people should do. They should know God. Watch this. A priest happened to be going down the road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Verse 32, so to a Levite, also another professional church person, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. Now, as soon as Jesus says Samaritan, everyone's like, what? Because he, a Samaritan, would have been an insult in that, in that day. They, they were, they, for, for Jewish people, they had developed an animosity towards Samaritans. When, when you insulted, in fact, when the crowds insulted Jesus when they were mad at him, they called him demon-possessed and a Samaritan. So when Jesus says a Samaritan, everyone's like, what? When he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, look after him. He said, when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense that you may have. And Jesus asked the question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He says, who do you think was being neighborly? Who do you think was truly being loving? Watch what he says. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Do you want to know what this whole thing's about? Do you want to know how you express your faith? You love God. You experience parisos. You experience alignment. You experience God doing great things in your life not chasing after the world, but chasing after God and experiencing that fruit. And then what do you do? You give it away. You share it. This is what full-throttled living looks like. All right, I want to give you two thoughts today. I want to give you two thoughts on how to experience full-throttled, opened-up living. It's gonna look, we're going to look at full-throttled generosity. Before we do, I want you to turn to two people and say, the more you give, the more you live. Find two people and say, the more you give, the more you live. The more you give, the more you live. The first thing I want to tell you is this. Full throttle generosity looks like being aware. Everybody say aware. You know, when you live full throttle, when you live with your pedal to the metal, you have to be aware. I've only driven like really fast, like super fast, one time in my life. I'm not going to tell you how fast I was driving because it was neither safe nor legal, and I don't know what the statute of limitations is on fast driving, so I don't want any further persecution if any this would be distributed out. I was going fast, too fast. I thought I was safe, though. It was isolated, all right? And, but I would never do it again. Kids do not try that ever. Nobody ever drive fast. It's not good, unless it's on a drag strip. But when I was not on a drag strip, <laughs> um, and what I noticed was when I was driving fast, you have to be really aware because things are coming at you fast. Things come at you fast. You live opened up, you live pedal to the metal, things come at you fast, right? You gotta be more aware. The Samaritan lived with awareness. He lived with awareness. His eyes were wide open. The priest and the Levite were living with their eyes shut. We don't know what they were doing. We don't know where they were going. Maybe it was another worship concert. Maybe it was another Bible study. Maybe they had busy things to do at the temple. We don't know, but they were too busy to do the one thing that Jesus is saying is the most important thing. 
It's like you've got all of this time to do this, but this is what's in front of you. He says, how does this work? How do you be a neighbor? You find needs. And in order to find needs, you know what we have to be? we got to be aware. we got to be aware. we got to open up our eyes. we got to see that there are people all around us. There are, we got to see that there is ministry everywhere we look. There is ministry opened up. There are people who are hurting. There are people who need God. There are people who need encouragement. Every day, there is an opportunity to share the fruit that you have. Every day. Every day, you know what we should do? We should wake up. We should pray, God, I, I love you. I seek you today. Lord, fill me full of you. Give me that parisos. Give me that abundance. Give me that extra, that unnecessary. And then help me give it away. Help me be aware of people who are around me. Help me be aware of needs that are around me. Help me be aware of people who, who have been robbed laying in the streets, who are broken, who are hurting, who have been ripped off by the devil. Help me find those people and help me share the fruit that you've given me. Amen, church? You can amen. You can shout. You can clap. Anything. But just, I just want to know, this, I, this is what we're supposed to do as a church. This is who we are supposed to be. And Jesus is saying, you need to start praying prayers like, God, help me be so much less self-absorbed and more others aware. Aren't we so self-absorbed in our society? And again, if we're not careful, we bring this into our Christianity and Jesus is saying, hey, look, there are people who need encouragement. In fact, Jesus will say this to the disciples after he's met the woman at the well. He's talked with her. And he says, these people are coming back. He sent the, the woman out into the city. She brings back all of her friends. They want to meet Jesus. And he says, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. He's not talking about food. He's talking about people. He's talking about needs. He's talking about people who are hurting. There are people who need prayer. There are people who need an encouraging scripture. There are people who need an encouraging word all around. And just as we worship, we talk about one word from God. Things change under his authority. They change for us. And when you know what they should do? They should change through us. God, change me. Lord, let my heart be more open. Let my heart be more full. And then God, help me to give that fullness away in Jesus' name. This is who God created you to be, experiencing overflowing life, not stale fruit, not stale fruit. There's ministry everywhere. Second thing, full throttle generosity looks like sacrifice. So you got to be aware of the needs, and then once you go to meet those needs, you got to be willing to sacrifice a little bit. Let me just say, in order to do what God has called you to do, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. It's going to be painful. Think about this, this Samaritan. He had places to go. He had people to see. He had a, a to-do list probably to check off. It's not like he wasn't busy and the priest and the Levite were. Of course he was. He was going somewhere. But he sacrificed his time, and he sacrificed his money. He sacrificed literally putting himself in harm's way. This guy got robbed. He could have got robbed helping the guy, right? Maybe that's why the priest and Levite didn't help him. If you're going to be who God wants you to be, you're going to have to sacrifice. That word um, compassion or pity in the Greek is the word splagnitomai. Splagnitomai. It almost sounds like a sneeze. Splagnitomai. God bless you. And that word means yearning or movement. It literally means to be moved as to one's bowels. It's like that, that feeling you have in your stomach, like, I got to do something. It's like, oh, I got to, I, I have to, I can't just sit here. But it doesn't just stop with a feeling. It moves with compassion. True compassion demands action. With Jesus saw people's need, people's needs. He always did something about it. Never did he walk by and just be like, oh, there's someone blind. There's someone, there's someone who's hungry. And just be like, oh, man, someone should really do something about that. I'll pray for him. He never did that. He never did that. Was Jesus busy? I, I think he probably was. Did he have important things to do? I, I would imagine probably the most important things to do. You know what he says? Here's a need right here. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. I'm going to engage. You know what one of my prayers has been this year? God, help me to be fully present in the moments that you are putting me in front of. Whatever meeting I'm in, whatever, whatever situation I'm in, whether I'm with my kids, when I'm with my wife, God, help me to fully engage and not be distracted by my phone or by work or by all the other things. I have to, whatever you have me in right now, help me to be aware and help me to engage. And to sacrifice what I think is important for what you think is important. You're going to have to sacrifice a little bit. True compassion demands action. This guy, this Samaritan used his own money, his own time. Now, here's the thing. Here's, the, here's why we don't do this. Because all of us want to do this. But the reason we don't do this is because we're waiting for margin. Right? If I only had a little margin, then I would do this. If only I could find a little bit of margin, well then, yes, then of course I'd be the person who God wants me to be. Do you know where you're going to find margin? Right next to the, <laughs> right next to the unicorn and the leprechaun. All right, that's where you're going to find margin. At the end of the rainbow, it doesn't exist. Margin isn't something you find, it's something you create. If, if you want to be generous, if you want to live open-handed, if you want to live a generous life, you've got to create margin. You can't say, once I have enough time, then I will give back. Once I have enough money, then I will give back. You'll never give back. What, what, is, what is Jesus trying to say is I want you to create margin. I want you to create ways, systematic ways of giving back. Now here as a church, this is what we're all about. We're about helping you do this. And let me just say this, that's why being a part of a group is such a big deal. And you hear us talk about this all the time, but being in a group, being present in a group. Listen, there are going to be moments when you don't want to go to your group. Do you know, that's probably the moment that you need to go to your group. Because <laughs> how many of you know the devil doesn't want you to show up and encourage somebody else? Or the devil doesn't want you to show up and get the encouragement that you need? He's like, oh, no, I'm fine. I'll just, I'll catch it next time. Man, that's the time you need to get in there. Is it going to sacrifice, is it going to cost you something? Yes. Is it going to be worth it? Yes. For you, maybe. For someone else, hopefully. For someone else, hopefully. You can share the fruit that God's doing in your life. Well, I need something too. Well, go to group. You give, you take, you share. You get invested in, you repeat, and then you get healthy. And that's, so being in a group is really, really important. Showing up prepared for group is really, really important. Praying for your group, really, really important. Again, when you start living, pulling back, you won't live opened up, and you're going to miss out on what God has for you. Then using your gift, and we, again, we're, this is what we really want to encourage you to do, whether it be doing something like building a ramp. For those of you who like to swing a hammer, you like to just be out there in the field. It's like, get me out there. We, we are doing this stuff all the time. We want to change the world through active generosity. Here at church, you know, there are people who are coming. They're coming to church each and every week because they've given up on everything else. And so they're coming. They're giving us a chance to show them who God is. You standing at a door, you being out in the parking lot, you praying for them, you hosting online, hosting a service online, hosting a watch party even, using your gift to help people in, engage with church, being on the worship team, being on the production team, serving the kids area. There's so many different opportunities. You can use your gift to give back. This is the way we share the fruit. And then certainly the financial aspect of it, generosity. This is, this is how this works. God gives us the tithe. It says take 10% to, to build up the body of believers, to, 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 to create a place, a house of worship, but then to flow through that. And that's why we love highlighting all of the ways that we are making a difference God wants you to stretch so that you can give. Will you stop? Will you be aware? Will you open up and live full throttled? The more we give, the more we live. I want to I wanna share a story, something I saw a few years ago on ESPN, one of their, like, their life uh, E60 stories, or it was a 30 for 30, you know. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those, but they're really powerful and you know, you, you, you think you're watching sports and all of a sudden you're crying. It's like one of those moments. And there was a story a few years ago that, ha uh, that they highlighted of these two high school athletes who had, who had gotten really close 
Uh, one was named Leroy Sutton, and then the other was D'Artanian Crockett. And D'Artanian was uh, basically had found himself without parents. He had he'd been homeless, and he was legally blind. So he, he really couldn't see very far. And then Leroy was a double-leg amputee who, as a kid, was walking by a train, and the train, he had his backpack on, the train grabbed his backpack and then threw him underneath the train, and he lost both of his legs. Both of these kids grew up in inner city Cleveland and had overcome incredible, incredible difficult lives. Incredible difficult lives. But they met, they met as uh, high school athletes on the wrestling team, and they formed this bond because they were the only too strong enough. They're both really, really strong. They were the only too strong enough to really spar with each other. And uh, so ESPN does this story, and it shows some of the footage from the story. I want to show you just a little bit of it. Uh, they formed this bond, and ESPN shows this story. And, and uh, because Leroy can't walk and, and D'Artagnan can't see, they help each other. <laughs> so they, they just, and so it was this whole idea of like, man, we're, we're building this bond, and we're helping each other through life, and and, um, and they're on the wrestling team, and they're encouraging each other. And just, it is a powerful story of friendship. They end up uh, being able to not only get through high school, but they end up graduating. Uh, they both graduate from their high school that had a less than 40% graduate, graduation rate. And it was, a, it was a really cool story of how partnership and being generous and encouraging each other uh, results in a... In a monumental difference and so it was it was a great story and so this story aired and after the story airs people watch it and they're like oh man we got to do something about this this is amazing we want to help these guys as they continue on in their life and so they start emailing the producer who's named lisa fenn totally different upbringing lisa grew up upper class ivy league and and they started saying hey i want i want to help i want to be a part so many emails so many phone calls, people had started to send support, and Lisa started to feel a tug from the Holy Spirit that she was supposed to help them in the next phase of their life. So check this out. She's got this dream job, ESPN producer, making heartfelt stories. She quits her job so that she can full-time basically be a mom to these, to these boys and help them navigate the next part of their life. She helps him go to college. Uh, Leroy uh, gets a job working uh, in computer uh, science. D'Artagnan ends up uh, pursuing judo at the Olympic level. And we'll show some of the footage here. Uh, and she helps them navigate all of these things. Leroy uh, ends up uh, being a dad as well. And she helps, she helps him walk through that incredible uh, opportunity and experience. And then D'Artagnan um, gets connected with judo and ends up uh, being on the Paralympic U.S. team, Olympic team. Uh, in the 2012 London Olympics, ends up beating Russia for the bronze medal. Come on, somebody. You know God's in that. Um, and he was so excited and so thrilled. And it was really because, and if you watch the video, and I would encourage you to do it, they, at the end, they, they really say, Lisa, and there's Lisa, giving a hug. It's because one person saw a situation, an opportunity, and said, I'm going to be involved. I'm going to engage. I'm going to lean in, and I'm going to do something about it. And Lisa, at, she's a strong Christian. She has a book, and uh, there's a whole story. You can go watch it, but she says this. Because they were asking her, why, would you, why, did you, why did you stay? Why did you give up all of that to engage in a situation that was so different? You didn't have to do that. You didn't have to do any of that. Why would you give up so much to, to pursue something that would require such sacrifice, such involvement? And she says this, I stayed because we get only one life. And we don't truly live it until we give it away. Nothing is closer to the heart of God than that who gave away his very own son to engage in our mess, to redeem us. This is what Jesus is trying to get across. He's trying to say, hey, listen, live opened up. 
And when you do, is it going to be messy? Is it going to be risky? Is it going to be difficult? Is it going to cost you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it will. Let's not water that down. It will require a lot. But what will you get in return? So much more than you ever gave. You'll get a chance to be a part of the heart of God, the Holy Spirit, leading and working and advancing and helping. And you know what it's going to feel like? It's going to feel like going zero to 60 in under two seconds. It's going to feel, it's going to feel like ludicrous moon. This is our opportunity. What if we took it? What if as a church we leaned into this and we say, God, my, the fruit that you're doing inside of me is not just for me. It's so I can give it away. And, I, and what if we actually planned for margin so that we can do this? And this is what we want to do as a church. We want to help you step into this. This is how we move forward. Now, here's, I just want to say this. I really believe that what God is doing in our church is special I believe we're going to look back at this moment. We're going to say that there was something that happened then that God opened up and really propelled us forward. It's happening now with, with the things that we're working on. And I just want to encourage you to jump in and be a part of it. Let's go. Let's do this. The needs around us are many, but God is able and God is definitely willing. The question is, are we? Amen? Would you stand with me at both locations? Let's just take a moment. Let's respond in prayer. And let's just dedicate our lives. Will you just create a moment, a little, little sanctuary right there, a little personal encounter with God? Will you just close your eyes? And we just make a, a place with the Lord? And will you allow God just to do a little business uh, in your life right now? Just, just open up your heart. And would you just, would you just say, God, I, I, want you to have, I want you to have my life. I want to live open-handed. I want to live full-throttled. I don't want to live for me. I want to live for you. I want to live for the kingdom. I want to make a difference. Lord, I pray that you would bring about a radical, full-throttled generosity that looks like compassion, that looks like meeting people's needs, that looks like being aware, that looks like leaning in and sacrificing, that looks like being less self-absorbed. Help us, Lord. Speak to us. Help us respond to you in the ways that you want us to. Help us to see what you want us to do and bring about, bring about that perfect plan the redemption of God, bringing people home, opening up. Let it happen. Let it start with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship.